Are you struggling to believe that if God has saved you, you are forever saved? We'll discuss this wonderful truth, the truth of God's amazing love and his amazing grace as we continue our journey through the scriptures on Untwisting the Gospel. have asked me, Dana, do you believe once saved, always saved? Well, I say depends on who's doing the saving. If God has saved you, you are forever saved. 
End of story. No argument. Well, Dana, how can you be so sure? This takes us to our text in Jude. Jude 1 says, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept, meaning preserved, sealed for Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Kept for Jesus Christ. Kept means kept. If God has called you and you are beloved in him, you are kept until the day of redemption. You may not like it, but it's true. Well, why don't people like it? Because they feel that, no, you have to do something. How do you get to heaven? You got to be right, do right, live right and all. And if you don't do these things, you won't go to heaven. That is not true. You are saved by grace alone. And that grace teaches you to do what is right. You do what is right, not in order to be saved. You do what is right because you have been saved. Let's see this again in Ephesians chapter one. We looked at it last week, but I, I think it bears looking at again. Ephesians chapter one, verse 13. In him also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, meaning the message, the story of Jesus Christ, his death, burial and resurrection, having also believed you were sealed. You were what? You were sealed or preserved in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge or earnest. Or earnest means you set down money, proving that this is your possession and you have an intention to redeem it, to, to bring it back or to pay for it in full. Again, verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. God saves you and keeps you to the praise of his glory because you are his own possession. And because God is our father, he is our protector and he will not allow one of his own to be lost. Why? Because we were promised to his beloved son before the foundation of the world. And when God the Father makes a promise to God the Son, you can be guaranteed it is going to happen. Again, we are the beneficiaries of what was established before the foundation of the world. I think we can just take about 10 seconds and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Though we have been saved and we are forever being kept, that doesn't mean we don't sin. But our sin does not change our relationship to God. The sin of the believer does not change his or her relationship to God. Well, Dana, you're saying you can do anything you want. I didn't say that. You're thinking that. And because people who think that do not have a clear understanding of what grace is. Grace teaches us to say no to all ungodliness. Those who have been saved by grace desire to do good works, not to be saved, but because we have been saved and desire to please and glorify our father in heaven. Now, Ephesians 4 verse 30 says just that, that we can, that our sin does not change our status with God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, do not sin. When the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, do it. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were, what's that word there? Sealed for the day of redemption. We were sealed. Justification occurs the moment we believe. It means that a believer, a sinner, a rebel is put in right standing by God. Again, we saw in Ephesians 1 that the moment you believe you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, God seals you. He puts you, he declares you to be in right standing with him eternally. 
forever. Justification is a one-time event. Sanctification is a process. And during that process, we may grieve the Holy Spirit by our sin, but it does not change the fact that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. People who live by the law have a hard time believing that. I tell that to people that say, well, Dana, that means you can sin and, 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 and get away. No. All of our sin was placed on Jesus Christ. Past, present, future. If you don't get that, you're going to live a life. Of, uh, I call it spiritually schizophrenic. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. God loves me not. No, God loves you. And he will do whatever is necessary to conform you to the image of his son. And that includes discipline hard discipline, but he does it to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. John 6, 38 says this, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me that all that he has given me. Who's that? All the father has called those who are called be loved in God the Father. Again, verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him, just as in Ephesians 1 13 will have eternal life will be sealed by the Holy spirit until the day of redemption. And I myself, meaning Jesus Christ will raise him up on the last day. I mean, the scripture speaks for itself. It just shouts it. Jesus, you know, Jesus said it himself. There are those who don't like Paul. I just want to inform you. There are, Christian groups, people who do not like Paul, and they try to pit Paul's writings against Jesus. So they say, well, we're only going to follow what Jesus says. Well, Jesus said right here that all the father gives him, he will lose none. That is the will of the father. He will lose none. And if you are in that number, you will never be lost. Amen. Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd meaning he protects his sheep. Jesus protected his sheep with his life so that his sheep might have life eternal. We see this in John 10 verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29 tells us why no one will snatch them out of his hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one, meaning they are both committed to the eternal protection of the sheep. What God has determined to do, no one can change that. God does whatever he pleases and it pleases him to save his sheep. There are those who are not truly secure in their belief of the preservation of believers. And one of the reasons is because they have read Revelation 3 verses 4 and 5. So let's look at that. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Verse five, he who overcomes. Well, who are they? They are the called beloved in God, the father and kept for Jesus Christ. He who overcomes 
will thus be clothed in white garments as those who were obedient in the in the city of Sardis. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There are those who read that to mean that your name, even if you are a believer, if you are not totally obedient, if you do not do everything necessary to stay saved, that you can lose your salvation and that your name can be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. This is not what this passage of scripture is saying. It is saying that all those who belong to God are totally secure, that they will walk in white robes, meaning the righteous at deeds, white, those robes represent the righteous deeds of the saints. And there is no way their name will be ever blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. It will not happen. It's not saying there's a possibility. It is talking. It is saying that there is absolutely no possibility and that Jesus Christ will confess the name of every believer before his father and before his angels. So there's no need to be confused about that. It's not saying your name can be blotted out. It's saying that God will never do it. It is impossible for God to do it because he has promised to save and preserve all the father has given to him. When were these names written in the book of life, in the Lamb's book of life? We find the answer in Revelation 17, verse eight, the last part. And those who dwell on earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, meaning those who were not called beloved in God, the father and destined to be kept for Jesus Christ. Those who are not saved, they will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. This is talking about the time of the end when the beast and the false prophet, they do all these uh, miraculous things. And they, those whose names are not in the book of life will wonder after him. But those whose names are in the book of life will not. Why? Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 24, false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. And we know from the previous scripture that this is impossible because God protects all those he has called. We are protected by the Holy Spirit and we are his sheep and a stranger we will not follow because of the grace, the love and the power of God our Father. God has always preserved those he has called. We see this in Romans chapter 11, verse two. God has not rejected his people, meaning Israel, whom he foreknew or predetermined to love. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept or called and preserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. The same God who preserved those he called out of Israel will preserve those he called out of the Gentile world. God will keep them all just as God kept those he called out of Israel under the old covenant. He will keep those he is calling out today under the new covenant and they will be kept until the day of redemption. Second Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. In other words, produce fruit in keeping with 
repentance. Those who belong to God produce fruit in keeping with repentance, not in order to be saved, but because they have been saved. At the core of the gospel message is the fact that God keeps those. He preserves those he has called. He preserves and keeps those he loved before the foundation of the world. The gospel is not only is it the death, burial, and resurrection, it is also what was accomplished on the cross. Jesus died for our sin, that we might be forgiven of our sin according to scripture. He was buried. And our sins were buried with him there and he rose to newness of life that we might rise again from the dead to newness of life. And it also includes the fact that we are sealed. We are covered because of the sacrifice, because God accepted Jesus's sacrifice. And the proof of that is that he rose again. And because he rose again, we are protected under the new covenant that was ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is at the core, the foundation of our faith that we are sealed by God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Second Peter 2, 4 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, verse six, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued or preserved righteous lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, here's the key, verse nine, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. First of all, how did the people become godly? Through godly sorrow. Where does godly sorrow come from? From God. A godly sorrow produces repentance. Well, who grants repentance? God grants repentance. It's all of God. God's calls. He saves. He loves. He preserves not only from the wrath to come, but from the present temptation. God knows how to do it. Oh, we serve a mighty Almighty God. This is why the grace of God is so amazing. For years, I was singing the song Amazing Grace. I love the tune. I love the way it sounds. Even people in the world will sing Amazing Grace. It will bring them to tears, but they do not understand the saving grace of God. And when you understand that, it changes your life. Not only do you, you understand what Jesus did, but you understand what it means. It means that you are a new creature, that you have been made alive with Christ. And as a result, you no longer desire to live for yourself, but you desire to take up your cross, deny yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus Christ, no matter the cost. And you know that you will persevere. You know that you will be preserved until the end. There's a difference in doing something, hoping you will be preserved and knowing you will be preserved. When you know something to be true, you have a totally different attitude and you take far different actions than you do if you guess, well, I, I, I hope this thing works. If you know a bridge is solid and it will take you across, you will walk along there with no doubt. You keep on going. But if that thing looks rickety, you don't know it's going to hold up. You, you're not going anywhere, are you? Jesus Christ is the bridge that links us to God and that bridge will never collapse. It doesn't sway in the wind. It is, it is a rock it, that carries us all the way to heaven. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Romans 3, 29 says, for the gifts and the calling the gifts, what gifts? Grace, 
through faith, leading to salvation for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. What does irrevocable mean? Irrevocable. What does kept mean? It means kept. God will keep you because he will not go back on his word. He will keep you. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by a single offering, he, Jesus, has perfected for all time, meaning justified with perfect standing before God, those who are being sanctified. And who are they? The called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And here it is in verse 17. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. God doesn't keep us because we deserve to be kept. God keeps us because he has invested in us. He has made us his own. And as a good and righteous father, he protects his own. I know people have had bad experiences with fathers, and sometimes it's hard for them to understand this concept. But brothers and sisters, God is not like man. God is not like man that he should lie. Our father, God, is perfect in his love. He is perfect in compassion, and he loves us in a way that no earthly father can. So if you have never been loved that way by your father, I'm here to tell you today day that God, your father, loves you that way. And when you trust him, the more you trust him, the more you will see and experience that love in ways that will blow your mind and bring joy to your heart. Matthew 26, 27 says, and when he had taken a cup, and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. What covenant? The new covenant, which is poured out for many, meaning the sheep, the call, those beloved in God, the father for forgiveness of sins. The sin issue has been taken care of. God will never condemn you for the sins of your past. He will not condemn you for the sins you commit today. Now he will correct you for the sins we commit today. And he will correct us for the sins that we commit tomorrow, but he will never. There is therefore now and tomorrow, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So knowing this, this makes Romans 8, 29 just come to life. This is the statement that should bring so much joy, but there has been so much argument over this fact. Why? Because the enemy does not want God's people to have a clear understanding just how secure we are in God. Romans 8, 29 says, for those whom he foreknew, meaning those he predetermined to love before the foundation of the world, not because we're lovable, but because he is lovely and loving. He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, meaning firstborn from the grave. Verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also call. And those whom he called, he also justified, made right with him forever. And those he justified, he also glorified. It's talking in the past tense. Why? Because it's already done. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, according to his predetermined will, who is or can be against us? Father in heaven, we thank you that we are your children today, that now we are your children. Lord, we thank you for this liberating truth that we belong to you and that you are protecting us, not just from the wrath to come, 
but you are protecting us from the tempter and from temptation that we might glorify you. Father, again, we pray for those who are outside of the ark of safety. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, those who are who are very much like we were, lost in sin, that you would have mercy upon them and call them home by your spirit. Lord, may we pray for them. May we seek every opportunity to guide them and to show them and to give the message, the saving message of the gospel. May we too say, as Paul said, we are not ashamed of the gospel for it is your power unto salvation for the Jew first and for the Gentile. Father, we thank you for the truth of Jesus Christ, that you sent him to save us and that through him you love us and that we are being kept until the day of redemption. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope that this message, these series of messages and lessons have encouraged you to walk by faith in this wicked world. Faith in what God has already done through Jesus Christ and what he has continued and what he has promised to continue to do in, through, and for us. And until we meet again, Let's pray together. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen.